Well, real life, it's good to see. Uh, well, you know what? You guys aren't here. We had a, a well problem, and so we're all at, you're all at home now. But that's not going to stop us from worshiping our King this weekend. Amen. So would you sing with us as we still worship our King? Nothing will stop us from singing His praises. Let's worship. excited that you logged on this evening to worship with us because tonight we are celebrating a God who is so, so good. He is worthy of our adoration. He is worthy of all our praise. He is the purifier of souls. He is in control of all things and we get to worship him. So as we continue worshiping this evening, would you just let these words be more than words and actually become your prayer? Worship tonight with us with everything you are. Let's continue. Humble. We 
God lift our souls to another give us clean hands give us pure hearts let us not lift our souls to another and God let us be a generation that seeks that seeks your face oh God of Jacob we bow our hearts we bend our knees oh spirit come make us whole we turn our eyes from evil things oh Lord we cast down
of peace. Father, we lift your name on high. Just that name. God, we sing songs to you. Like you, you calm the seas, the darkness trembles. Worthy is your name. God, we sing these songs in confidence, knowing that we don't need a building to praise you. Knowing that that COVID can't stop us. Knowing that prejudices and, and things going on in our world, that they don't stop us. That they have no control over you. That we still get the right. We still have the ability to bow our heads, to bend a knee, to lift up your holy, your just, your worthy, your good, good name. Father, you protected that. You protected that. You told us that even the gates of hell will not prevail against your church. And that includes whatever is happening in our today. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the ability to learn about you. We thank you for the ability to be able to sing to you. Be it on a couch or in a pew. It is always, always a good day when we get to lift your name. So Father, would you open our hearts? Would you open our minds? Would you bless this sermon in abundance? Would you flow out of Pastor Mark? Would his word pierce every heart that hears it this evening and tomorrow? Father, I ask this. Father, I beg you for this. Would you do things beyond our imagination through this weekend? Just show off. And we will give you all the glory. And we will give you all the honor. Make less of us so there is more of you. Praise you, God. In Jesus, Jesus' precious name, amen. Man, guys, it is good to be in the house of the Lord today, isn't it? Man, if you are new with us and you are just now logging on and this is your first time ever joining us at Real Life Online, we want you to know that real life exists, exists to introduce Southern Maryland to a relationship with Jesus Christ. But man, we don't stop there. Another relationship that we are crazy passionate about is a relationship with you. So we want to know, we want to know all about you. And one of the ways that that can happen is by logging on to our website right now at reallife.us. We want you to log on there and find our connect with us link. When you find that link, we want you to click on it and just fill it out. It's just a one second, it's super fast, little survey there. And it just basically, it tells us who you are. It tells us where you're at. It tells us what you're interested in. If you want to be baptized, there's a little link to do that and then a member of our team is going to reach out to you and we are going to make contact with you I mean we want to pray with you we want to encourage you along in your walk so make sure you do that all right guys thank you so much for your continued faithfulness in giving we offer all of our regular online giving options to you this <coughs> weekend all right let's ready our hearts for the word that God has laid on Pastor Mark's heart. One more announcement by Pastor Chris. Hey, Real Life, Pastor Chris here. Last year, we launched our Disciple Bible Study Program. We had over 20 people engage in Disciple. This year, we are once again going to be offering Disciple One. And for those who took Disciple One last year, this year, we're going to be launching Disciple Two. Disciple One is an intensive Bible study that lasts 34 weeks, starting in Genesis and going all the way to Revelation. Disciple One requires 30 minutes of study every day, a commitment to an interactive two-hour class once a week, and the study guide will cost $30. I know that sounds like a lot of time, energy, and money, but trust me, it is worth the effort and expense. Your knowledge, understanding, and love for the Scriptures will increase tremendously. 
Disciple 2 covers the same amount of time, study, and investment, but we stay in four books, Genesis, Exodus, Luke, and Acts. If you are interested in Disciple 1 or 2, then go to our website, reallife.us slash disciple, fill in the information, and I will get back to you and tell you the days and times of the classes, which will begin in mid-September. Class sizes are 15 people maximum and will be on-site at Real Life with all the COVID-19 regulations in place. These classes are first come, first serve, and we are currently only offering one Disciple 1 class and one Disciple 2 class. So if you are committed, ready, and willing, then go to our website and sign up today. Come journey with us as we explore the Word of God together. Let me start with a question. Did you have a good week? Okay, I I admit that is a boring question. So instead of saying, did you have a good week, let me ask it in a different way. Were you good last week? Okay, that's that's harder. And and you might say, well, was I good? Well, I, I didn't steal anything. I, I didn't run anybody off the road with my car. I didn't, uh, I didn't spread malicious gossip of, about somebody that would destroy somebody's life. I, I didn't lose my temper on the kids too much this week. So uh, I wasn't bad, and that's good, right? I mean, I mean, isn't goodness the absence of badness? So if I make it through the week and I wasn't bad, that's good right? Or is it? The reason why I ask you if you are good is because we are right in the middle of our series on the fruit of the Spirit. These are nine character traits, and let's just be honest, they are not natural to us. These character traits are the fruit or the result of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So we could say it this way, as we said in the beginning of the series— that the proof of the Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit. That moment when we surrendered our lives to Jesus, when we gave our lives to him, the Holy Spirit was given to us, indwelling us and working in us. So how do we see this work of the Holy Spirit in our lives? Is it through impressive gifts of the Spirit? some of which we are all given? No. The hard evidence of the Holy Spirit working in our lives is the fruit of the Spirit. So let's look at Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 25. Now this is the text that we have been diving into as we've been going through this series. And it's also the text that we as a church have committed to memorizing during this series. So Galatians chapter 5, verses 22, and and as you notice that uh, each week as we go along, more and more of this text is blacked out. This is to help us in our memorization process. So uh, at home, read along with me, uh, from memory, obviously, um, as we go through Galatians 5, verses 22 through 25. All right, here we go. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we uh, live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Very good. I'm impressed. Not surprised, but I am impressed. But today we are looking at goodness. Now, okay, I admit that sounds kind of bland. I, I, I know, I, I get it. And you might be thinking, okay, this is going to be a, a short a sermon. Just, hey, be good this week. Got it? Okay, you're dismissed. Cool. And we say be good 
like we're used to hearing that phrase. Your parents may have said it to you. I know I say it to my kids. Every time my wife and I, we leave the house to go run some errands and we're leaving the kids at home alone. We, and as we're closing that door, we say that phrase to them, be good while we're away. Now, when we say that phrase, be good, what we really mean is, hey, don't mess the house up. Your mom just spent two hours cleaning it. Don't break anything. And for, and for whatever you do, don't kill each other while we are away. And, and I must admit, I even used a phrase a time or two as I gave that lecture. I even said things like, I don't care if you just sit there and do nothing. Just don't destroy the house and don't kill each other. And somehow, this has become our idea of good, of goodness. But seriously, goodness, what is it? What isn't it? And and where does it come from? And why is goodness so desperately needed in a world that's so full of broken dreams, uh, broken hearts, broken homes, broken families, and, and yes, even broken bodies? And I wish I could tell you that goodness will, will change the world. Possibly, but I don't know that for sure. But what I do know is that it will change you. Goodness is something that we, that we grow in. It, it will change your heart. It will change the way you see people. It will change the way you uh, relate to those around you, those in your life. And it's very important that we talk about it today, that we focus on it today, but, but focus is what we need to do. Because this is one of those sermons that if we're not careful, we could walk away from hearing this sermon and say something like, hey, that really gave me something to, to think about. But if we're careful, it will never really go anywhere in our lives. And it won't be go anywhere even on our calendar for the course of this week. So this is my challenge right here at the beginning of my sermon and also at the end. Who is that person? that could be the outlet of of a Holy Spirit-led goodness this coming week, or if not a person, maybe an environment or a situation. Maybe it's that team that you're trying to coach in the middle of this pandemic and, and you're trying to bring out this untapped potential that you see inside of them. Maybe it's at your office the job site or your place of work and and you're seeing some things that aren't quite right and you're feeling compelled to take a stand against unethical behavior and unethical uh, patterns. Maybe it's someone in your extended family that you know that you need to approach and confront with, with grace and truth. Maybe it's the ministry in which God has called you to and you're involved in and and the Holy Spirit is going to quicken you to uh, maybe this week use words or your body language or even just acts. That would be an encouragement to the team you serve in. Maybe it's that one friend, someone in your oikos, that individual person that's just going through a difficult season right now and you just realize you just got to rally around them and give them strength goodness so where does goodness come from actually it's found on the first page of your bible in genesis chapter one we see this this image of of god speaking And, and as he speaks god is creating And he's speaking and he's creating and it creates this rhythm that we read in Genesis chapter one and it'll say something to the effect of, and God said, and then he creates. Then it'll say, and God saw that it was good and there was evening and morning the first day. And then it'll say again, and God said, and and God saw that it was good and there was evening and morning the second day. 
and God saw that it was good on the third day, and God saw that it was good on the fourth and the fifth day, and we get to the end of the sixth day when God is looking at all that he has created, and we see this in Genesis 1, verse 31. God saw all that he had made, and here's that adjective, and it was very good. Very good. In Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, we are witnessing this creative generosity of God. And, and I find it interesting that as we read through this rhythm and this refrain, and when he gets to the end of, of, of 1 verse 31, when he's looking at all that he has made, he doesn't say, that's pretty. He doesn't get to the verse 31 and when he's looking at all that he has made and says, hey, this is beautiful. And I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was very pretty or very beautiful, but he doesn't do that. He gets to the end, looks at all his creation, and he says it is very good. And out of this creative generosity of God's character, out of this creative generosity of God's essence of his heart, this world springs forth and there's beauty and there's harmony and there is wholeness and the origin of goodness is our generous creator. I love it in verse 27 where it says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And here we see this image of God being transmitted to Adam. This goodness, this creative generosity is infused into Adam. And that is why everywhere we go, and in every environment, and in every conversation, we bring nothing but beauty and wholeness and blessing. And this is where you would say, stop it right there, Pastor Mark. I don't know what world you live in, but that does not describe my home, that does not describe my family, that sure does not describe where I work. So pardon the expression, Pastor Mark, but what the heck happened to this goodness that permeated God's world? And you are right. There was a disruption of goodness. Theologians call it the fall. And through the disobedience of one man, sin enters the world. And from generation to generation, it's like a cancer that spreads. And it affects every individual. It affects every friendship. It affects every marriage, family, church. It affects every community. It affects every job site, factory, office building, and every form of government. Sin permeates everything and everyone. The original goodness is dis disrupted. As we have been traveling through these fruits of the Spirit, these characteristics that God desires to grow in us, there's one word that we've not focused on yet. So let's go back to Galatians chapter 5, look at verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Okay, okay. But the fruit of the Spirit, but the fruit. It's this word but that grabs our attention. This, this word but is a contrasting conjunction where before Paul is going to list this fruit of the Spirit, he's letting us know he's comparing this to another list. It's a list where he gives us this fruit of the flesh or the acts of the sinful nature. So Galatians 5 verse 19 lists that, those actions. Since we live by the Spirit, the acts of the flesh are obvious, excuse me, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft. Now pay attention to this next few, one, few uh, items. Hatred, 
discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness and orgies and the like. Against such things, there is no law. So the apostle Paul is listing for us what describes this world out of control. And then he uses this contrast by saying, hey, here's this, these acts of the flesh, but there is this uh, fruit of the Spirit. And, and right in the middle, he gives us this list of kind of like a, like a relational kind of list where he mentions hatred. He mentions discord, jealousy, rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, faction, envy. In every shouting match that happens in your family room, every family that has been blown apart because something petty that had happened, every situation where there is uh, company politics that boils over and you're, you're no longer worried about competing with your competitors, man, it's all you can do at this moment just to try to keep your company together. You're trying to keep this office together. My friends, we can trace all that right back to this list. This list describes life without God. This is what we're capable of without his spirit's intervention. So goodness has been disrupted. Paul says it's obvious. This describes what has gone wrong around us. But there is good news. I said, but there is good news. There is a restoration of goodness. As the scriptures tell us the story of God creating our planet, the, the creator, the creative one, the one who called forth the world out of his generous creativity, he comes to his own creation to be a sacrifice for all that we have done wrong, and it leads us to the crucifixion. The story of the crucifixion is not about a Jewish teacher that somehow went sideways with the political structure and got himself executed. No, it is about the creator entering his creation and bearing the punishment for the disruption of goodness that has occurred. Now, when someone comes to the cross, God moves in. His spirit moves in and begins to change us from the inside out. And that is very significant language. Because we are incapable of self-rescue. I, I cannot be good enough to reach up to God. I need God to reach down to me. I need forgiveness through faith in Jesus by grace alone. And he took our punishment. And we have to receive this. We have to receive his grace. We can't earn grace. We don't deserve grace. It's just received. And Christ begins to change us from the inside out by his Holy Spirit. Now, I know sometimes we make the mistake and, and, and by saying uh, and kind of relating our life to a, a messy room and we say, well, this room is such a mess. I just want to kind of clean this room up before I invite Jesus in. Can I challenge you with something? My challenge to you is invite God into the messy room. Invite him into the mess to simply say, here I am. Nothing is where it is supposed to be. I'm a mess. It's a mess. Invite God into the mess. So about three decades later, after the crucifixion, after his resurrection, groups of Jesus followers began to emerge around the Mediterranean coastline, especially around the area of Ephesus. Now, Ephesus is the fourth largest city in the Roman world. It, uh, it's, 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 it's a pretty big deal. Jesus communities are established there. Churches are being established there. And the founding pastor, the Apostle Paul, 
writes a follow-up letter to the church in Ephesus. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says this, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works works created in Christ Jesus it's like a second creation a recreation we could say or we could say it this way in Christ we are recreated for goodness i like that in Christ we are recreated for goodness in other words he's saying you were made for this it seems what Christ is about to do in our lives is to restore this image of God that was lost at the fall, but also to give people around us with broken situations and broken homes and broken families, broken hearts, to give them a glimpse of his goodness because they see ours. I believe that our gracious creator is looking for a people, a family, to partner with him in the restoration of goodness. You are made for this. So what is it? What does goodness look like? Goodness is not the absence of badness. Goodness brings a generous creativity into a broken world. In other words, goodness does something. It's not just the absence of those works or the fruit of the flesh, but it's more than that. So to give a couple of examples, two chapters later in Ephesians chapter four, Paul's gonna give us a couple of examples. In Ephesians 4, 28, he says, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer. I just find this funny. He, he's writing to church people. He, he had already left. He's writing a letter encouraging them. He's writing to church people, and he says, anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer. He's writing to a people who made their livings stealing in the marketplace. And what I find it funny, not only did they used to steal, he's writing this letter to them, because obviously they're still doing it. So not only it was how they made their living, it's still how they're making their living is by stealing in the marketplace. I don't know how they were doing it. If they were, somebody was talking to somebody, creating a, a diversion or a distraction, and someone's coming up from uh, the other side and, and lifting their money purse or their wallet. I don't know how they were doing it. But he's telling them to steal no longer. Now, I can imagine this is important for a pastor to cover you know, thou shalt not steal, to use the, the King James language here, because stealing is bad. Now, I imagine the one reading this letter from the Apostle Paul. And, it's, and Paul saying, hey, don't steal. Steal no longer. And this person saying to themselves, okay, I, I don't want to be bad anymore. I, I don't want to be a thief anymore. So I will stop stealing. Okay, so he removed himself from badness. Now he's good, right? No, because goodness, as we said earlier, it does something. It's not just removing himself from badness. He's only halfway there. So let's look at the rest of the text. But must work. There it is doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. That's goodness. See, the first half of the text is him encouraging them to move away from badness. The second half of the text, he's encouraging them to embrace goodness. And there's a difference. He's 
encouraging them to be transformed by the Spirit of God to not be one who just goes out and takes and takes and takes, but to be transformed to be one who gives. The one who would work and, and have something, something beneficial to give, to be a help, to be a blessing to others. He's wanting to transform them from being givers to being takers. If we grab a hold of this, and all the many implications that we can apply this to, this would be a spiritual movement right there. That God would transform us from being people who are takers to be people who are givers. Oftentimes we promise to do good. And oftentimes we actually do nothing. See if you can relate with this. I, I know I'm guilty of this as well. You find out someone in your family or a close friend is going through a difficult situation. They may be going through a trauma or just a dark season in their life. And we usually reach out to them with a text or a phone call and we say these words. Or you, see if you're guilty of this as much as I am. We say something like, hey, if you need anything, just call me. If you need anything, call me. Have you said that before? Man, I know I've said that many of times. But do you know what we just did when we said that? We have just placed two more burdens on their shoulders. Because now, first, they have to ask. And second, they have to be creative enough to know what they need. And I know that sounds silly, but oftentimes people who are going through a, a dark season or going through a depressing time or have gone through a trauma in their family, just getting through the day is hard enough. They don't have to have the creativity to, to know what they need. So maybe we should change how we think. Doing anything is better than, doing, than promising everything and actually delivering nothing. Doing anything is better than promising everything but actually delivering nothing. So maybe we send that email. Maybe it's that text of encouragement. Maybe it's just sitting and listening to them and not worrying about expressing how you feel or what you think or what you would do in that situation. No, just listen to them. Maybe it's taking a meal to them. Maybe it's dropping by. Maybe it's picking up some chores they have around the house just to help anything. But instead of putting the generous creativity on their shoulders, maybe we put it on our shoulders instead. That's what goodness is. The creative generosity. Paul gives us another example. Ephesians 4, 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Now we could say talk. We could say text, social media, even our body language, the, the many ways that we communicate. Okay, so the one reading this, we could say, okay, uh, no unwholesome talk come out of my mouth. Okay, I got it. So as long as I don't gossip, as long as I don't run somebody down, as long as I don't slander someone's reputation or, or have a complaining spirit, then I'm good, right? No, you're just not bad. Again, you're only halfway there. So the Apostle Paul takes it one step further in the, in the second half of this verse. But only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Did, did you get that? But only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. 
So maybe we ask ourselves, how does my speech benefit the people who have to hear me talk? Is my communication, my text, my social media, even my body language, is it helpful for building others up? You see, goodness is not only the absence of destructive speech. Goodness is the presence of life-giving, edifying speech. Goodness does something. So let me take you to an eighth grade class. And in the middle of this class, there's that one kid that's always funny. He's always cracking a joke. And this time, he makes a joke. But he does it at someone else's expense. He says this joke, the whole class just erupts in laughter, and there's a smile on his face because he got people to laugh, but on this side of the class is that one girl who just kind of made a joke about, and she's humiliated, and she's embarrassed. What would goodness look like in this situation? So, so maybe you would approach uh, this kid uh, out in the hallway and say, dude, you are, you are hilarious. I mean, you are funny. But that was also mean. Is there a way that you can be funny without being mean? And he would probably say something to the effect of what? Are you the humor police? And to which you would probably respond, no. But listen, I, I know I will always remember you for being funny, no doubt. I just don't want to remember you for being mean. Now, I'm not saying this conversation is going to work, but I am saying that it is a good conversation to have, even if it doesn't have the desired results. But sometimes it's good to speak words of life, even though those words of life are not heeded. Can this conversation really happen in junior high? I hope so. Can it happen in college? Can it happen at 28 or age 38 or age 48 or even 58? I hope so. And there is this beauty that comes with goodness. When the Holy Spirit is growing in you, growing in you in such a way to, to have you reach out and stir your heart to be good and to show forth goodness in your life. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. It says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Did, did you catch that? Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds. And when they see your good deeds, they're going to glorify your Father in heaven. So in other words, when we show goodness, when we show goodness, it reflects on God's goodness. So when God empowers us to show goodness to others, it reflects on his goodness, and people will thank God. I'm reminded of the story of this young lady. She was driving back to college. And as she's driving back to college, she's a couple hours from home, and, and as she's driving down the road, she gets a flat tire. She pulls over to the side of the road, and, and there's a young family not far behind her. They see what has taken place, and they pull in behind her, and they help her change the tire. So she's back on the road. She calls her mom and dad, letting them know what had happened, that she got a flat tire, but this young family came in, and they helped change the tire. And as she is expressing this and, and sharing this news with her parents, her parents say this phrase that we all have said, thank God there was someone there. How about the woman who, new to a church, got involved in the church, got involved in life group, and had only been there 
three weeks, new to the area, transferred uh, from another area. Three weeks into her life group, her husband has a heart attack. Someone from her life group hears about it through social media, and they go to the hospital to sit with her. And that visit at the hospital, while they're waiting for surgery, is midnight, goes to one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, before recovery began. The next day, as this lady is calling back home to her family and friends, she's letting them know how her husband's doing, and she let them know that this lady from Life Group that she only has, has met three weeks ago had sat with her all throughout the night. And her family expresses, thank God you weren't alone. Another young couple that I used to work with years ago, while they went to work, their house caught fire. And before the fire trucks could get there, before they could rush back, everything that they accumulated, every, all pictures of their weddings and, and family, all their material possessions, gone. Nothing was salvageable. The community gathered around and friends and family. They took a collection and they were there for them and they helped supply their need. They helped kind of get them back on their feet. And, and years later, as they were reflecting back on this time in their life, reflecting on the goodness of each one of these individuals from the community and family and friends, they used this expression, God was so faithful to us during that time. We see this when, when people are acting in goodness, being led by the Holy Spirit to reach out in goodness. There's always this response where someone hears about it and says, thank God someone was there. Thank God you weren't alone. Thank God that he was so faithful during that time. Because our goodness reflects on his goodness. All the credit goes to God, the creator of the world, who infused goodness into Adam and Eve and who reinfuses and recreates and reestablishes patterns of goodness. And through Christ, who comes to live inside and by his spirit pushes out the darkness to fill us with himself, and we see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and now goodness. It is this goodness restored that reflects on God's goodness. And to God be the glory for that. Who do you have in mind? Who do you have in mind this week that can be an outlet of God's Holy Spirit-led goodness this week. Do you have that person in mind? That situation? That environment? Maybe it's words of encouragement. Maybe it's words of correction. Maybe it's just gathering around and strengthening a brother or sister and helping them be built up in their faith. What is the Holy Spirit leading you to do this week? Can I pray for you? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the working of your Holy Spirit in our lives. We thank you that at the moment we surrendered our hearts to you, you flooded us with your Holy Spirit. We thank you that from day one, there has been a working in our hearts, a working in our life, and you're indwelling us and working in us and producing these fruits of the Holy Spirit. So I pray, help us this week to be sensitive to your voice, to your leading, that we may have our eyes open to see those around us that we can be vessels of your goodness toward them this week. Sometimes it's just stepping in and helping. Sometimes it's stepping up and doing the right thing. But whatever it is for us this week, we pray your Holy Spirit would lead us and guide us into that. 
And we pray that the result of them seeing our goodness, these good works that we were recreated to do, that they would in turn thank God, give glory to our Father in heaven. We want to thank you for being a part of our service this week. If, if there's anything as this sermon has been going forth that you feel the Holy Spirit leading your heart to do or you want to reach out to us or you just want prayer this week or maybe you want to recommit your life to the Lord and you want someone to pray with you, talk with you. I want to encourage you this, this week, right now even, to go onto our website at reallife.us and fill out that connect card that Amy was talking about earlier. And there you can put a request, hey, I would love to have a pastor call me. Uh, I want to give my heart to the Lord. Or I, I want prayer. And we would love to get back with you. We love you. God bless. Have a great week.